expand our imagination. Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Cheryl Atkinson. Tonight, New York Congressman Charles Rangel finds out who his friends and political allies really are as he sees who turns up for his fundraising gala slash 80th birthday party. But Rangel faces more than an assortment of ethics violations and calls for him to resign. He's facing Adam Clayton Powell IV in New York's Democratic primary September 14th. In our continuing series, Behind the Ballot, Powell joins us from New York. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. And for our viewers, Mr. Powell, a reminder that you are the youngest son of the man that Rangel defeated back in 1970. Uh, yes, indeed. Now, Rangel took to the House floor yesterday and made a long speech. I want a quick comment from you as to what you thought as you saw him take the floor and watch the speech, and then we'll look at a couple of excerpts as to what he said. What did you think about that? I just thought it was unfortunate. Um, he really seems to be uh, in no man's land. Uh, I've called upon him as the president of the United States, Barack Obama, has called upon him to resign with some level of dignity um, and spare uh, his constituents in the uh, congressional district as well as the entire nation the agony of a trial that could very well end in his expulsion from Congress or possible uh, federal criminal charges. The fact is that we need to turn the page. Uh, the congressman is no longer chairman of Ways and Means. He is 80 years old. And the fact is, none of these accusations are helping him or anyone else for that matter. Well, let's hear uh, Charles Rangel some of his side of the story in his own words from the House floor yesterday. Here's some excerpts. But the Ethics Committee won't even tell me when I'm going to have a hearing. And heck, people are concerned about me. I'm 80 years old. I don't want to die before the hearing. You know? And uh, I think my electorate are entitled uh, to finding out who their congressman for 40 years is. Who, who am I? Am I corrupt? Did I get a nickel? What did they offer me? What about me? I don't want anyone to feel embarrassed, awkward. Hey, if I was you, I may want me to go away too. I am not going away. I am here. I am not asking for leniency. I'm asking for exposure of the facts. They've made a decision. I want you to make a decision. Mr. Powell, there are people who say that Rangel is so popular at home that he will win an election no matter what, unless he just steps down on his own. Is that your only real chance of winning? Uh, not at all. The fact is, there was a poll uh, three, four weeks ago that showed me only 18 percentage points behind, and this is before many of these revelations became public. The fact is, uh, everyone knows that in politics, the challenger will close the margin of the poll as the election of September 14th gets closer. And also, polls never mention the energy of a voter. And I can assure you, for obvious reasons, that a voter for Adam Clayton Powell is much more energized to come out and vote than a voter for uh, Mr. Rangel. So we're very hopeful that uh, we will uh, succeed, not based upon any of these uh, ethic violations, but based upon the fact that uh, we need to turn the page. I announced my campaign on April 12th. I ran against Congressman Rangel 16 years ago in 1994. Obviously, he won, and I didn't. But this time, we're very hopeful that uh, we will be victorious. I've been representing uh, part of Harlem in northern Manhattan for the last nearly 20 years in the New York City Council, in the State Assembly, with a very progressive record. And that's the same progressive agenda that I plan to take to the United States Congress. When your father was a congressman before Mr. Rangel, he was steeped in controversy. And you've had controversies of your own. I'm going to list a couple of them briefly. A driving while impaired conviction, admitting to having sex with a teenage intern six years ago, accused of rape twice, but you passed a lie detector test and were never charged. But does all of that make it harder for you to go after Charles Rangel for his controversies? No, not at all. The fact is that every situation is different. Uh, when my father uh, ran for re-election in 1970, all of those ethic violations of his uh, were behind. He had been reinstated by the United States Supreme Court. And the fact is, he was uh, in his late 50s. Uh, now uh, we have a different situation. The congressman is 80 years old. Um, these are ethic violations that are current. And the fact is that he should retire with some dignity, with some level of honor. He has four rent control apartments in Harlem, plenty of space for him to uh, live his retirement years, plus a Dominican villa. And so, um, as again, the President of the United States, Barack Obama, called. Uh, I have been calling for him to, to step aside with some level of dignity because the fact is there is an election on September 14th, and it would be better if he stepped aside and resigned with dignity than uh, go down in defeat or possibly worse, 
uh, get expelled from the Congress and face federal criminal charges. All right, last quick question, if you can just give me a paragraph or so. Um, Mr. Rangel held a powerful position when he was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He's been there so long and due to his longevity in part, was able to bring a lot of perks and money home to New York. You would come in as, as a very junior congressman. What would you be able to do for your constituents? You're not going to be chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. Obviously not. So you can't compare me or anyone else coming in uh, to, to 40 years in Congress. Uh, the fact is that 40 years creates a legacy, undoubtedly, but the fact is we must turn the page. Everyone knows that change is coming. Uh, Congressman Rangel will not be around much longer. The question is when will that change happen and who will replace him? And the fact is that I have prepared myself over the last 20 years and the fact is that I will be able to deliver because the the fact of the matter is the same colleagues of uh, Congressman Rangel of uh, 40 years or 20 years or five years are the same ones who call upon him to step down as chairman of Ways and Means. They're the same colleagues who are returning monies that he had donated to them or given them to charity. So he no longer has any effectiveness in the United States Congress. And many people don't see the point of why run for re-election to another two years. There is no point in that. Adam Clayton Powell IV, thank you so much. We'll be watching with interest. Appreciate thank it. You. From the battle in Harlem, we move to last night's primary winners and losers in Colorado and Connecticut. Our own Bob Schieffer and chief political co uh, consultant Mark Ambener join me now. Let's start first with the Colorado races and Bob Schieffer. Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado, a Democrat, backed by President Obama, he wins. This, this is a big deal, and it's especially a big deal for the Obama White House. You know, um, good news for the Obama White House has pretty much been on the endangered species list. I mean, they just haven't had any lately. And uh, this was somebody that uh, the president went out there and campaigned for. Uh, they really kind of put it all up on the line. And, but the even, I think, the even better news uh, for Democrats in general is the way it went on the Republican side. Uh, uh, this fellow, uh, Ken Buck, who many people say, well, I know the Democrats are going to try to portray him as a sort of a Sharon uh, Angle uh, kind of candidate. That's the Tea Party woman who won out in uh, Nevada. And, uh, you know, uh, they thought that was the weakest possible candidate to run against Harry Reid, who everybody thought was going to lose. Uh, Democrats, at least, are saying uh, this man uh, could be that kind of a candidate. I mean, this was somebody that in this campaign uh, said one of the reasons he should win the nomination because he didn't wear high heels like his opponent uh, who who was a woman. And while these kinds of things may play well in primaries, they the don't play well in a general election. So uh, I think uh, I think Democrats have, a, and especially the Obama White, White House, House part of the Democratic Party, really has a lot to uh, be glad about this morning on what happened in Colorado. Mark, um, if, if I'm correct, tell me, correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Uh, Michael Bennett was backed by President Obama. Andrew Romanoff got some last-minute support from former President Clinton, but that right. didn't seem, obviously, that didn't pull him through or pull him ahead. Didn't pull him through, although I think both endorsements helped. I think Bill Clinton's endorsement of Romanoff is what actually made it a two-person race. It really legitimized the idea that there are two candidates worth competing over. And what was very clear by how the polls, uh, the vicissitudes of the polls was, how voters, Democratic voters, took their time, really took nothing for granted, really evaluated these candidates. I think we're seeing in this, in this, you know, it's cliche to say it, but anti-Washington, anti-establishment time, what it means for voters is they're just not going to, you know, endorsements are nice, but they're really, really, really going to take the measure of each candidate and wait until the end to make choices. Do you think Michael Bennett will now stay as cozy as he can or as closely tied to President Obama, or oh. is this the time to sort of <laughs> he's push away a yeah, bit? Yeah, he's already cre creeping away from, uh, from the White House. He's already said, well, he's not sure yet whether he wants President Obama to come campaign for him. Uh, and his campaign is a little... They have a little bit of a bellyache because the White House is bragging so much about how much help they gave to Michael Bennett. And the last thing you want, aside from having senator before your name uh, running in this cycle, is to be tied to Washington or the White House in a, in a general election. So he's... Uh, he is he is slowly inching away from some of the factors that helped get him elected in the primary. All right, so Republican Ken Buck, who yep. built himself as an outsider, beat the Lieutenant Governor Jane Norton. Yeah, um, you know the, the the question for Republicans is whether Ken Buck is the got to put a you know duct tape over his mouth Tea Party candidate, or whether he can successfully transition into a more mainstream Republican uh, candidate. Uh, he is 
perhaps more discipline than Sharon Angle, the Republican candidate no, in Nevada, has a little more experience as district attorney, so knows how to make an argument, at least, which is a plus in political campaigns. But he's very, very conservative. And even though we're in a midterm election when Republicans have an edge in the political environment, he is probably, at this point, too conservative for that state. All right. Let's move on to Connecticut and Bob. Wrestling mogul Linda McMahon, a Republican, now faces Richard Blumenthal, the Democrat Attorney General for Senate. What are your observations? Uh, I, would, I would nominate this as uh, perhaps what will be the nastiest of all the contests uh, come November. Uh, Linda McMahon brings her own set of uh, kind of issues. I mean, you know, you know, do you take seriously somebody that uh, headed up professional wrestling? Uh, there's a whole steroid issue here. There's violence. Uh, there's all that kind of thing going. She spent a tremendous amount of her own money, which is, I think, the reason that she became a serious candidate. She said she's she going to spend $50 And she'll, million. she'll spend a lot more. Uh, but then on the other side, you've got Richard Blumenthal, who was telling people about going to be serving in Vietnam when it turned out, well, he actually was in the Army, but he didn't quite get to Vietnam, I think it was. Uh, so that's going to be an issue. But uh, uh, I think at this point, uh, Blumenthal has, has a pretty substantial lead in the polls. Uh, you know, the, the thing that I think came through last night, and I, and I don't want to quote myself, but I said it, but of course I will, <laughs> as we all do. Uh, I said at the beginning of this cycle that I, I had felt that the Tea Party posed a much more serious threat to Republicans than it did to Democrats in general. And I think we saw a little of this last night. Yes, there's a big anti-establishment uh, feeling going around in the country, but Republicans seem to take it out on their people. And, and the more conservative ones won in their things. It didn't seem to have that much of an impact on Democrats. Now, we'll see how all this uh, plays out in November. Well, McMahon is the underdog, but she pointed out that she was something like 40 points behind Blumenthal at one point, and she's narrowed that to something like 10 points. Is that gap closable for her? Maybe in the scripted world of professional wrestling, it's perhaps <laughs> easier for an underdog suddenly to, you know, to defeat the reigning champion. But Now, wait, wrestling is real. There's, there's no, isn't you know, there that I, I went through a loss of faith when I was a child learning that it was fake, so please don't tell me it's real again okay. because that would just be, Go that ahead. would be a, a, a mind bender for me. Linda McMahon made her money, the money that she's spending now when she was the chief executive officer of World Wrestling Entertainment. So the company that she ran, she's running as a successful business person, except when you ask her about the company that she ran, she doesn't want to talk about it. Dick Blumenthal has, an, has a, you know, has a, a solid record of fighting against companies that do wrong, companies that have problems, that don't treat their workers correctly. And he's going to make a big issue out of WWE. He has, though, perhaps the taint of being a politician all of his life. So you have these competing dynamics. I think it's going to be a closer race than it is now. But I would say at this point, Blumenthal probably has the edge, even though she's going to have a lot more money. Blumenthal may be able to get past the Vietnam statement that he made, but it, I think voters sit there and wonder, even when politicians get past it, where these things come from. Yeah. Obviously, he knew whether he was in Vietnam or not, and it reminded me a little bit of the Hillary Clinton statement where she said she had ducked sniper fire in Bosnia. Her war record. Right, right. right. and there had been no sniper well, fire. To try and tie it all back to Charlie Rangel a little bit, I think what it creates is a sense of, or it fosters the idea that politicians have this sense of entitlement where they can yeah. get away with, with misstatements even egregious misstatements, um, uh, politically sensitive misstatements, the last thing you want to do is, is misstate your service in Vietnam. That's something that even voters of, of my generation, you know, who, who weren't, weren't alive back then really understand. We, we know that that's not a good thing. Um, and I think that gets to the heart of what a lot of voters think is wrong about Washington. And that's why when that is relitigated, that issue, during the general election campaign in Connecticut, it could hurt Dick Blumenthal quite a bit. All right. Thank you so much, Bob. And Mark, if you'll stay put, we're going to sure. move on and look back at the life of former Senator Ted Stevens now, who was killed in a plane crash Monday night. The man who once described himself as a, quote, mean, miserable SOB left behind a complex legacy. Once a giant of the Senate, his career was brought down after corruption charges cost him re-election in 2008. Also joining us now is Matt Felling with our affiliate in Anchorage, KTVA. Matt, I just want to start out by saying, is there anything new we need to know this morning that you found out about the plane crash? Any, any other information that wasn't out there last night? Uh, with regards to the crash, they are just getting down to the scene this morning because the, the weather there has been, it's going to continue to be treacherous. 
the weather is going to be the main contributor to the senator's death, as well as the leading cause as to why the investigation might drag on for a while. Uh, it's hurricane season in the lower 48 on the East Coast, and it's it's coming to be the fall rainy season here in Alaska. I know it's tough to believe it's already hitting fall, but August is known as rainy and very dangerous, but it's also conflicting interests. It's also the peak of silver salmon, which is what the senator was taking advantage of. And it really was a family outing. I was looking at the list of the people on the plane, and three pairs of parents and uh, sons or daughters were on that flight. So uh, it was definitely a, a, just a retreat with friends and family. Well, if the information I've read is correct, and I know it's still developing, is it unusual or expected that Stevens, no longer a senator, would be in a corporate-owned plane with uh, kind of high-rolling private industry folks um, and their children? You know, I think we all expected that or knew that was occurring when he was senator, but why now, I guess? This is part of uh, how he continued to live even after he left the Senate. Yeah, it's clear that uh, he continued to uh, be completely enmeshed in industry and in Alaskan industry in particular because aviation, one of the men was a former chief of NASA, and uh, the other person was a GCI telecommunications executive. That's what GCI is. It's basically our Comcast up here, or Cox. And uh, he was still uh, networking with these people. They were people that he'd associated with his entire life. There were people that he considered friends. Even when he was at that corruption trial in Washington, D.C., one, uh, one of the most difficult things he had to do was realize that this friend of his, this longtime oil tycoon, uh, Allen, uh, had, had sort of uh, served him up on a platter to the investigators. I think that he treasured, uh, you know, his old bromide was to heck with politics, let's do what's right for Alaska, but it's clear that his, uh, his habits of just, uh, you know, spending a lot of time with the people who, who kept him in office, put him in office, and also uh, he, he developed personal attachments with these people, and that's something that uh, went beyond political for him. And yesterday was one of those weird moments that you get every once in a while where everybody sort of put down their political hatchets. Even the, the, left, the leftist person in Alaska just had to drop it and say, listen, this guy created this state. Uh, he, he was in public service for six decades. We're only 51 years old. So this guy... We all sort of paid attention and paid heed that this guy was a major icon for this state, regardless of how he went out. Uh, Mark Stevens was a powerful appropriator when, when he says that he built the state. He, he brought, mm -hmm. I don't know how many billions, home to Alaska. Um, some people thought it was disproportionate to what Alaska really should have had, but certainly he was very popular at home because of that. What do you see as his legacy um, as now that he's passed? I think, you know, his legacy will, will I mean, there's a generational divide. I think Alaskans who... Um, you know, who are familiar with all the money that he brought to the state. I mean, Alaska is, uh, is um, you know, what they call a net debtor state, and perhaps the most uh, debtor state in the country because of the amount of money per person it gets from the federal uh, government. But that's in part because, again, the way the state is, is, is set up, you have to have an enormous infrastructure that, that the tax base can't support. Um, I think that you know there, there's a number of politicians that come to mind who have had long and storied careers who grew entrenched and again toward the end of their career became fairly uh, comfortable with the trappings of power and that led to abuses of some sort and and they were you know either convicted or charged with certain crimes but I think most people remember them by the physical stuff that they've built the legacy there I think again younger voters probably will have less of a, a, a positive impression of Stevens because they're used to seeing the controversial Stevens, the Stevens who mumbles about a series of tubes on the internet versus the Stevens who worked really, really hard for many, many years trying to make sure that, you know, Alaska received its fair share, if not more, uh, uh, of money from Washington. Matt Felling, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for joining us and, and filling us in on what's going on up there. And we want to add another news item now that uh, according to a family friend, Associated Press says Democrat Dan Rostenkowski, who served 18 terms in Congress, has died. So I wanted to ask Bob Schieffer, another controversial former member of Congress, uh, you know, uh, was it corruption charges that he was... And another of? former chairman of the House mm -hmm. Ways and Means Committee, uh, who was literally one of the most powerful people, not just of his era, but of all time in Washington. Again, uh, one of these politicians that... Uh, he was there so long that he came to have, I thought uh, Mark used a very good word, uh, a sort of a sense of entitlement about anything goes. And, and I, I've seen this over and over where, you know, uh, these people come here, uh, they amass all this power, but they don't make very much money. 
it's all in you know the the trips and all of that that they get and they come to feel like look I'm doing all this for my folks back home I deserve all of this and uh, Danny Rostenkowski one of the uh, <clears throat> most fun interesting uh, characters uh, to be around. I mean, I covered him a lot was I, I was on Capitol Hill, and it was always fun uh, to cover him, uh, unlike Ted Stevens, who, who pretty much a lot of people agreed with his own assessment of himself, that he was a mean <laughs> SOB. Uh, uh, Danny Rostenkowski was, was a great character, and, uh, and he was very, very powerful. But in the end, uh, it just kind of <clears throat> like happens to so many of them. He kind of got carried away with himself. Well, CBS News has confirmed uh, his death, and he was indicted in 92, charged with misusing government and campaign funds, lost his bid for re-election in 94, served 17 months in prison, got a pardon from Bill right. Clinton in 2000. Enormously popular within his own party. Another difference with Ted Stevens. The Democrats love Dan Roskin, Dan Rostenkowski, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, it, you know, and, and I, again, I, I, I remember <laughs> I remember how big a story that was, and I was 14 years old, I think, when when some of the some of the some of the the luster began to tarnish. But I remember sitting in my my economics class in high school, and the teacher said, "You know, the most powerful person in this country is who has more influence over economic policy than anyone in president." No, Dan Rostenkowski. Well, who's that? We learn. Well. Um, uh, you yeah. know, Mark, uh, and the one that he has succeeded, of course, yeah. was Wilbur Mills. Right, Will, Will, who Wilbur wound Mills. Up, who you know, he also was had very a, popular. Well, tried he also, um, and had wound up with the Argentine fountain. firecracker, Fanny right. Fox. Fanny F and Fox. They and drove the, the car off into the. To the uh, there is something about that ways chair, and ways and yes. means, that just, <laughs> you know, um, uh, I, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, there, that's that's. <laughs> that, 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 I didn't really, I remember that now, Wilbur Mills, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks to both of you. Appreciate it. Bob Schieffer, Mark okay. Anbender, it's been interesting as always. Thank you. And thanks to you for watching Washington Unplugged. You can join us right here every day on cbsnews.com. Don't forget to catch my Follow the Money reports on the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. I'm Cheryl Atkinson. We'll see you next time.